the fourth talk in a series I've given, separated, of course, by the pandemic. Um, but over recent years, I have given three other talks on this subject. And it all stems from Ramesses II and his time, perhaps the most controversial book that Velikovsky wrote, um, where he claimed that the Battle of Kadesh, fought between the Egyptians and a Hittite coalition, was the same as the Battle of Carchemish, fought between the Egyptians and the Babylonians. A, a reconstruction like that uh, of both Egyptian and Hittite history means it has to be dragged down by about 670 years. Because he's taking history that the, ba the Battle of, uh, of Carchemish is dated to about 12... 70, 12, 80, something like that, conventionally. And he's saying, no, it happened in 605 uh, when, when uh, Nebuchadnezzar's army fought the Egyptians at Carchemish. So it's a massive difference. Various SIS articles discuss this. Uh, Trevor Palmer and, and Don Mills on one side and me replying on the other. And to be fair, None of us came up with a, a definitive argument. It was inconclusive. Uh, certainly, the arguing in favour of Velikovsky was inconclusive. So, what I decided to do was try to put the battle in a wider context. And, I, and that's what the previous talks have been, uh, have been about. And it's brought me to this final talk which, as you see, is about Supiluliuma the first, and Taharka, the Egyptian pharaoh. And this was the other major piece of chronology that uh, Velikovsky put in his book, Ramesses II in the Time. He argued that the Hittite king Supiluliuma the first was a contemporary of the Egyptian pharaoh Taharka. Now, the big issue here was. Supiluliuma received a letter uh, when he was besieging the city of Carchemish. It was from a pharaoh's widow. Her husband had died and, and she was saying, you've got lots of sons, could I have one of your sons to marry? Um, and Velikossi suggested it was the death of Taharka and his wife that wrote to Supiluliuma. And uh, the Harka conventionally is usually dated to 664 BC, uh, his death. So what Velikovsky is saying is Supiluliuma I was besieging Carchemish in 664 BC, not 1370 BC, which convention says. Um, and that is what I want to look at today, specifically that uh, correlation of Velikovsky, or suggestion maybe. Uh, what has gone previously in my previous talks is uh, spring meeting 2018, uh, I took the two battles and said, right, well, what happened in the next generation? Now, in, uh, that means it's down to the sort of 560s, 570s BC, and looked at Hittite history, moved down by all this time, did it fit? And actually it did. Um, these things, which I won't go into through detail, happened both in Hittite history and in the normally accepted history of, of the 6th century BC. Um, we even identified an individual with almost the same names who was a fugitive in Western uh, Anatolia. And it, and it ended with the destruction of the Hittite capital. Then I looked at another, another era, the generation before the battles, and compared the Hittite history, dragging it all the way down 670 years, 670 years, with the conventional history of the uh, latter part of the 7th century. And um, again, there was quite a tie-up. The Hittite king attacked Ephesus and, and Priene, and a guy who was heavily involved in that appears in both histories, Tarkudimi. In the 
questions at the end of that talk, Philip raised the issue of the Phrygians. And so I then went back about 60 or 80 years from my third talk and looked at the end of the 8th century BC, looking at Phrygian history. And this was a very strong correlation because in both histories there was an invasion by a people called the Casca of the Anatolian Plateau. Uh, it lined up to uh, a Hittite king, Arnawanda, and a, a, a king in Anatolia called Amberidu, very similar names. And in both histories, there was a guy called Mita who was a real pain in the neck and had captured three separate cities. And actually the names of the three cities in the Hittite history and in the Assyrian record are virtually identical. So those three talks gave a lot of correlation between the two histories. Um, right back with, in 715 BC with uh, Mita, the king of uh, Phrygia, ca uh, capturing the cities, right through to the eventual destruction of the Hittite uh, capital. Um, again, each of these things that we've listed appears in both histories. But there's this bit of a gap, because, because Philip mentioned the Phrygians, I jump back from here up to there, over the gap around the sort of 670s, 660s. So that's what I want to look at today. The specific uh, issues, could Superlulium of the first have lived at that time and been therefore a, a contemporary of Taharka? Where I want to start the talk is to go back just in front of that and look at this, what I call the Casca invasion. In the Hittite history, the Casca invasion is described in some detail by a later Hittite king, Hattusili III, writing about a century after the events, actually. Um, but a lot of what he, he wrote can be confirmed by earlier Hittite uh, data. But his is the best description of the dreadful situation at the time. So this is, this is what Hattusili wrote. In early days, the Hatti lands were attacked from beyond their borders. The enemy from Casca came, sacked the Hatti lands, and made Nanassa his frontier. Then the enemy from Arzawa, that, that's a western Anatolian country, came. He sacked the Hatti lands and made Tuwanua, his front, Tuwanua and Uda his frontier. Another enemy came from the west again uh, uh, and, and attacked. Um, then, from beyond again, the enemy from Atsi came. Atsi is, to, is, is well to the east uh, of, of um, the Hittite homeland. Um, he sacked the upper lands and made Samuka his frontier. And there's more, and the enemy from Isua across the Euphrates came and sacked the land of Tegarama. Yet again, from further south east, uh, an enemy came and made the city Kizuwatna his frontier. Kizuwatna is in Cilicia. And then uh, the, some problems, the, the, the capital, Hattusus, was uh, burned down. Uh, and I think he was, tr if we had, didn't have bits missing, he was also worried about the mausoleum. Right, well, let's put, let's put that on, on the map. Uh, the Hittite capital is Hattusus, or Hattusa up here on the middle of the uh, Anatolia, Anatolian plateau. And these arrows show all the different attacks. Now, they didn't, they didn't happen at once. They happened, it looks like, over about 30 years. Because when you come to the end, it's about a generation and a half since it started. So it lasts for about 30 years. Um, you have the Casca, who lived right up in the north, they attacked and made Nanassa their frontier. So they came right, right past the capital, sacked the capital, and then moved south, obviously towards the Taurus Mountains by the Taurus Passes, threatening further south. Uh, enemies from the west came from the north, and also from 
further uh, south here to Tuwanua. Tuwanua is the classical Tayana um, from Acts of the Apostles and things like that. Um, and then you have the attacks from the other side. The enemy came from Azzi, right over here, um, attacked the upper land. That was particularly nasty for the Hittites because when the capital was sacked, the Hittites fled to the upper land. It's called the upper land because it's, it's the highest lands and reasonably safe. But they were attacked from an enemy from this side, but that enemy then moved back and made Samuka his frontier. And Samuka is, is uh, the area around Malatia on the Euphrates. So uh, that's why you've got the funny uh, angle there. And then enemies also came across from Isua, attacked Cape Tegarama. You, that's Tegarama there. You can hardly see it because of the arrows. And then the enemy came this way into uh, uh, Kizuatna, Cilicia, and, uh, and made a frontier then. So they were attacked on all sides. But the main problem was the Casca. All the others obviously took advantage of the Casca tribesmen flooding uh, into the capital and destroying it and taking over the, the main Hittite, Hittite homeland. So this was the first one, that Casca came and sacked the Hittite lands and made Nanasa his frontier. And as we said, they then dominated the area for about 30 years. That's the Hittite history. If we move that to around 700 BC, what do we find? It's around 710 BC, the Assyrian king Sargon records that he built fortresses in Cilicia against the Casca. Now, that ties up perfectly. The Casca invaded, came as far south as Nanasa, which is a good base for then coming through the, the Taurus passes into Cilicia. So, there's a good confirmation there that the Casca had invaded. Later Assyrian references don't use the word Casca, they use the word Gimerai. And, and this gives the Greek word Chimerians, which we tend to use nowadays for, the, for these tribesmen. And this is often called the Chimerian invasion, uh, but, but initially, clearly, it was, it was the same people, the Casca. Eventually, it all, things started to change about 30 years later, in 679 BC, the, Ass the Assyrians moved uh, into Cilicia and into the west of Cilicia and, um, and attacked the, uh, the tribesmen there. They were clearly trying to come south into Cilicia and the Assyrian king sent a major army and, um, and defeated them. And that seems to have started the end of it. So, about 30 years in the Hittite history, it lasted for about 30 years in the Assyrian history of 670 years later. So there's immediately there's quite a good tie-up. What else did Hattu Sili said? He said the enemy came and attacked Tegarama, the enemy came again and attacked Cilicia. If we look now at the uh, early 700s, uh, 7th century, uh, early 6, 696, 695, the Assyrians campaigned in eastern Cilicia, same as Kizawatna, and they attacked what they say is Tilgarimu, which is the same as the Hittite Tegarama. So there is another tie-up. These two attacks recorded by the Hittite history also happened in the early 600s. So again, what Hattu Sili said has tied up rather well with what was happening 670 years later. From beyond again, the enemy from Atsi came, sacked all the upper lands and made Samuka his frontier. As I said, Samuka is the area around Malatia, on the, on the, just on the west bank of the Euphrates. 680 BC, there's a campaign inscription of Rusa II of Urartu, uh, the Hurrian land around Lake Van. 
tells of his attacks, uh, a major campaign, initially on the inhabitants of the Pontus, then the Hittites, and then the Phrygians. Now, the land of Adzi, or, or Adza, as it's sometimes called, was extensively developed by Rusa, and it is between Urartu and the Pontus area. So the, the attack came from the same area, Adzi, as the Hittites said. And the campaign enabled him to set up his frontier near the Euphrates. This is confirmed by some archaeology at a place called Norsen Tep, just to the east of, the, of Malatia, um, where there, has a, there is a Eurasian uh, building, uh, classic Eurasian style, showing that they had uh, uh, s their troops uh, on the border near the Euphrates. Again, what Hattu Sili said in the Hittite is completely confirmed by the history of 680 BC. And particularly to explain that last one, Rusa uh, of Urartu is based here, around Lake Van. He attacked the Pontus area first, and then into the uh, Hittite area, and in fact, seems to have gone much further and attacked the Phrygians over here uh, on the Sangarius, uh, in the land of Phrygia. Um, but then, Having done that attack, came back to the Euphrates uh, and uh, set his border there. So the details in both histories tie up. So we look four attacks on to summarise four attacks on eastern Anatolia recorded by Hattusili the third are confirmed in the history of the invasion of 710 to 680 BC. The Casca invasion, the invasion uh, of the upper lands coming from Adsi, and the attacks on Cilicia and Tegarama. There are no records at this time of what's happening further west, so we can't, uh, we can't confirm the, the, attacks, the attacks from the west. Remember, there were six attacks that uh, Hattusili uh, described Four of them tie up nicely, the other two we just can't check. But in that period from 710 to 680, in the period of the Casco or Cimmerian invasion, there are no other attacks. We've confirmed, we, we've shown that four of the attacks that Hattu Sili uh, described also happened in the early uh, years of the uh, 7th century BC and there aren't and there weren't any others so it's not as though i would taken some and selected there are only four in each case that are attacks from the east so the tie up uh, over this 30 year period between the Hittite history and the, the history mainly recorded by the Assyrians uh, is exactly the same. So that's the invasion itself. We now come on to what happened after the invasion. Uh, in Hittite history, we now go to another very detailed document called the Deeds of Superluliumus. And this is a, a detailed history of Superluliuma I, written by his son, Mersili II. Um, quite detailed. And it starts when Superluliuma was only the crown prince. It goes back that far. And what it, it starts with is the initial breakout. They had been uh, restricted to the upper land, defending themselves for 30 years. And then, eventually, under their king, Tukalia III, uh, with the help of his son, uh, who would become Superlulium of the first, they broke out from the upper lands and they took Samuka. Now Samuka, as we said, is the area around Malatia. In 680 BC, the Assyrian king Azahaddon got very worried about two Hittites. And he, he, he prayed to his, his god about them. 
and, and it's recorded what he prayed. He was very concerned about two individuals. Um, somebody called Muganu, who, who was sometimes working on his own, but sometimes working with uh, Ishkalu of Tabal. And they had captured Malatia, Samuka. So you have a, an exact replica in the two histories. A king and his son took Samuka. A king and some other guy captured the same area. So again, a very tight tie-up. Now, it doesn't take much logic from there on to think Ishkalu is the Assyrian form of the Hittite named Tutkalia. So you have, in both histories, you have a Tutkalia as, as the Hittite king, king of Tabal. It has to follow that this guy called Mugalu has to be Tutkalia's son, if the two histories tie up. His name would not be Superluliuma, because he wasn't king. Superluliuma is a throne name, a name taken by the king when he succeeded his father. Now, we know that the Hittite kings had personal names, which were quite distinct. And quite, they, in fact, they were quite unusual because they weren't Hittite, they were Hurrian, um, which, is, which is strange. The other thing, we know Superluliuma, the son of Tutkalias III, succeeded his father. And the Assyrians record exactly the same. This Mughalu succeeded the Tutkalia, or the Ishkalu. So we have more tie up here. Um, this Mughalu, who, who from the previous slide we thought has to be Superluliuma, uh, the son of Ishkalu, uh, he inherited the kingdom. Uh, so he probably was his son. So it, it all ties up very closely. What I want to do now, and it's a, it's a little bit of an assumption, but it's, it, it's, I think it's pretty good. Mersili describes his father's deeds in great detail, and basically they look as though he did this, he did that, he did that, and each one is a year. Uh, in some cases, he actually says he retired back to so-and-so for the winter. So it's clearly a year. And the general assumption is what Mersili is describing is each year as a campaign. And I'm going to take that assumption because what I'm going to try and do is start to date things as closely as I can. Because these two histories are tying up very closely. Back to the, the, the document. Uh, having taken Samuka, Tutkalia and his son uh, made it their, uh, their base and they started to attack the Kaska more widely. Um, and one particular case, Tutkalia took a Hittite army quite a long way to attack the Kaska and, uh, and their leader, who, he, who is called in the text Tutu, at a place called Salapa. Now, in six, in six, uh, sorry, in 679 BC, the Assyrians attacked the Kaska stroke Cumerians and their leader, who they call Tushpa. Now, Tushpa is not quite the same as Tutu, tu, but there's some similarity in the names. And this Assyrian attack was um, at Kubushna, or the classic, uh, classical Kybistra in western Cilicia, about as far west as the Assyrians ever went. <coughs> if we look at the map, Kubushna is over here, Kubushna, Kubushna. Uh, the Assyrians obviously coming from here, across to attack the Kaska, who had obviously moved a bit, a bit south and were threatening Cilicia. Uh, the, uh, the Assyrians defeated them and, uh, and it says they, they chased them back north. Back to the Hittite history, the Hittites are based over here at Malatia. Uh, and Tutkalia III takes an army to Salapa to attack the Kaska. Now, Salapa is just north of Kubishna. So, 
if I'm right, this campaign by Tutkalia is taking advantage of the Assyrian campaign. The Assyrians defeated them, drove them back north, and the Hittite king think, well, this is as good a chance to really have a go at them. And, uh, and therefore he marched right across to Salapa, presumably to, um, to attack the retreating uh, Kaska. Now, that's a bit tentative, but I'll use it as a, as a starting point for a dating. The attack on Salapa uh, happened maybe in 679, same year, or maybe the next year. Um, but clearly, if I'm right, um, and Tutkalia was taking advantage of the uh, uh, of the Casca being thrashed by the uh, Syrians, then it might have happened in 678 or 679, round there anyway. What happened after that is three years later, because there's, there's, there are two or three things in between, the son uh, that we, we, we know eventually became Superluliuma asked his father, Tutkalia, if he could take an army and recapture the capital. And so three years after the Salapa campaign, which would then be about 675 BC, if I'm right, uh, Superluliuma marched to the capital, Hattusa, and captured it. In fact, the Kaska saw him coming and ran away. <laughs> there wasn't a battle. Now, this is very interesting, because if we now go back to the information of the, from the Assyrians, in 675 BC, an Assyrian campaign was launched against Mughalu at Melid, uh, which is a Syrian form of Malatia. But it was unsuccessful. They marched there, but didn't engage the Hittites, and came back. In fact, it's not an Assyrian record. It's written by the Babylonians, who would have recorded uh, failures as well as successes. Um, it doesn't, that doesn't appear in, in the Assyrians. They ignored it. But this ties up. If they went to attack Mughalu at Malatia, they must have had good evidence he was there. So he must have been there in 676, and then in the spring when the weather gets better and they, they went to campaign against him, he wasn't there. Why wasn't he there? Because he'd, he'd marched to the capital to take it. So it ties up. Uh, the, the history of Mughalu at each stage appears to reflect the history of Superluliuma. Once established in the capital, the father and son were involved in four more campaigns, likely to be four years. Uh, and you can see west of Garcia, that was punishing the, the people who'd, who'd uh, attacked from that side, north uh, to uh, push the Casca back further, southwest to push uh, people out, and eventually south west to uh, southeast to Kamuk and then southwest to Tayana um, because that was another place that Hattusili III said had been attacked. So you see what Superluliuma Superlulu, is doing uh, with his father. They got the capital back, now they're pushing back on all those attacks that happened from each side, uh, trying to take the whole sort of Hittite land back. The campaign to Tuanua is the last time Tutkalia III is mentioned in the, the document, the deeds of Superluliuma. Um, again, if, these are, if my dating is about right, then this brings us, these uh, various campaigns are through 674 to 671. So, if I'm right, then Superluliuma became the Hittite king probably around 671 BC. His father isn't mentioned later, so presumably he died. Tutkalia had been quite unwell. I think he was quite an old man. Um, Superluliuma, his son, was probably in his 30s at this stage. Uh, the, the deeds document records that Tutkalia sometimes returned to the upper land because he wasn't well uh, for, for the odd year and that. Um, and it appears he died 
around this time. Uh, so again, within a year or two, if I'm right that the history, you know, uh, and Velikovsky was right, that the Hittite history comes right down to this century, then Superlulioma became king pretty close to 671 BC. About year three or four of Superlulioma, difficult to tell from the document, it could be year three or, or four, um, Superlulioma set out to punish another of the invaders. This time it was to the Mitannian king um, and to attack their capital, Wasukani. Um, now this is, this is way to the east. Um, in other places I have already identified Mitanni as, as Urartu. Um, and this fits because this was the last major person to uh, attack. That, that attack uh, from Urartu, from the east, that happened in the uh, uh, period of the Casca invasion, uh, this was the last major power to, uh, to attack and punish for, for the attack. Um, but when the Hittites marched all that way to Wasukani, there was no battle. The, the uh, enemy king withdrew. Uh, they sacked the capital um, and then started to march back. But for some reason, Superlulioma decided there was an opportunity to take the last of the Hittite lands that had been lost, and that's North Syria. So instead of going home, he hadn't fought a battle of any description, so his, his, his army was still fresh. So in the same year, he marched to northern Syria and was generally welcomed because there were a lot of Hittites that lived there. They always had. Um, but obviously it had been, all been lost uh, uh, in the previous years. Um, so with my dating, his taking of northern Syria, setting up a base at Aleppo, is either 668 or 667 BC. And I suggest it's probably 667 BC because in that year, the Assyrians were a long way away. Under their king, now Ashurbanipal, they had attacked Egypt. Now you can imagine, if, uh, if Superluliuma had was marching west from, from Mitanni, from Urartu, um, and he knew the, the Assyrian army was in Egypt, what a perfect chance to re recapture uh, Syria. Uh, so it fits. So I got to a point where I had to choose between the two, so I would suggest 667 is a perfect opportunity for uh, a, a northern Assyria to be taken. And just to show that campaign, uh, the Hittites are coming from Hattusas on the, the capital on the plateau. Uh, Superluluma in, in other documents describes the, uh, the campaign. They, ca they cross the uh, Euphrates into Isua, uh, then across the north of the Kashiari mountain range uh, through Kutmar. Uh, little doubt where they were going. But having not had a problem there, uh, and no battle, instead of marching back that way, he came down into northern Syria uh, and was basically greeted. There, there, there was very few skirmishes in taking Syria. He was more or less uh, greeted with open arms. Um, but he, could, he did not take Carchemish and didn't attempt to take it. Uh, but the rest... He, uh, he captured and installed uh, one of his sons. Uh, again, he had, he had, by this time, he had several adult sons, uh, a son called Telepino, and he, he, he was based, obviously, with a Hittite army in Aleppo, in northern Syria. Back to the seventh century, where we're trying to place Superluliuma, is there any evidence that there was that the enemy of the uh, of Ashurbanipal was in northern Syria? And there's this uh, record from a uh, an Assyrian official um, reporting back to his the Assyrian king Ashurbanipal 
The first bit's always about, oh, it's all sorts of omens and things like this. But basically what he's saying is, the evil disturbance, which is in the land of Amuru, northern Syria, and its territory, is its own harm. The disturbance is the fault of the king of Amuru and his land for allowing the enemy of the king to be in the land. Now, there is only one known enemy of Ashurbanipal in the whole of the West at this time, and that is Mughalu. Uh, Ashurbanipal makes it very clear that in text that he considered Mughalu, Mughalu had been a major uh, enemy of both himself and his father. Uh, so here we have a, an Assyrian record that the enemy of the king is in Amuru, and if we go to the Hittite history, there is actually a treaty between Superlilium of the first and Azuru, the king of Amuru. So there's reasonable, reasonably good evidence that fits. Right, we're now coming to the siege of Carchemish, which of course was the crucial time of the, uh, 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 of the widow's letter. As I said, when northern Syria was taken, Carchemish was not attacked. It was the one place that was not attacked. That was in, I suggested, 67 BC. After it, there were two years when Superlulium was back in the homeland. Um, he had his son keeping uh, Syria okay. Um, there, were, there were a couple of years where he was starting to rebuild because, of course, he was taking... The, the country uh, had been badly devastated by the Casca. And so there was, there was a lot of rebuilding of, of cities and temples to be done and further skirmishes with the Casca. But then, three years after the Wasukani uh, episode, he did march to Carchemish. He had decided that was the last thing and he had to take it. So, my tentative dating has actually ended up with the siege of Carchemish being in 664 BC, exactly where Velikovsky said it was. Now, it could be the odd year out, but you can't be far out from this date if I'm putting the two histories together because two years later, Mughalu actually made peace with Ashurbanipal. He was no longer Ashurbanipal's enemy. It shows how powerful he was that Ashurbanipal never attacked him and was quite happy, in fact, boasted about the fact that he had calmed Mughalu and, and uh, the, 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 there was peace, that he had achieved what his father couldn't, sort of thing. Um, so, just to summarise that, I started off at 680, where it tied up that... Uh, the information from that year is that Ishkalu and Magalu had, were at Malatia and had taken it. That agreed with the Hittite history of the breakout to Samuka. In 679, I suggested that the, uh, the Hittite attack on the Casca at Salapa was linked to uh, probably a follow-up to the uh, uh, slaughter of the uh, Cimmerians by the Assyrians at Kubushna. We then followed through to 675, where we had the failed Assyrian campaign against Mughalu, uh, and I argued that failed because he wasn't there. He, that year he'd taken Hattusa um, and moved west. Then we had the Assyrian army in Egypt, a perfect year. You know, I had to decide, we had a year or two there, uh, not quite sure, but that was a perfect year to, to, um, to take northern Syria, because there was no Assyrian army to, uh, to get in his way. And then three years after that, Taharqa died. Um, so the two histories fit rather well, almost year on year. Uh, we started from looking at the Casca invasion, where the, in the, the details on both tied up remarkably well, 
and then followed that through and it ended it up at 664 BC, exactly where Velikovsky said it was. So that's the, that's the dating, but I have a few more things I'd like to say. So in the early 7th century BC, Mughalu was, in, in the west and northwest, Mughalu was the main enemy of Assyria. Was Assyria an enemy of Supaluliuma? Well, yes, because later in his life there was a, uh, major problems in the east and um, uh, an Assyrian army marched east to Urartu to uh, uh, sort things out. And all the time they were worried that the Assyrian army was coming. They were warned the Assyrian is coming against you in battle. As it happened, um, it speaks quite a bit of the Assyrians um, and, and the route they took to avoid them. So there was clear en enmity there. What is particularly interesting is early in the reign of Mursili II, who's, who was the son of Supiluma, he records that I sent forth Nawanzas, the, the Galgestin, that's head of the army, a uh, 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 Hittite term, with troops and horse to the land of Carchemish and instructed him, if the man of Ashur does come, fight him. So, so it's very clear that although the Hittites held Carchemish, it was under threat from the Assyrians. And I think it, it follows logically from what I've done so far that Supaluliuma must have taken Carchemish from the Assyrians. Uh, so it, it, it fits very well that uh, in the uh, in the southeast, um, Supaluliuma was an enemy of Assyria, uh, which fits with exactly with what we know of uh, of Mughalu. This is now on to what Peter was saying, because this is this was an issue that Velikovsky raised. What about the pharaoh who died and his wife? The Hittite text that records it calls the pharaoh Nibkururia. The H is pronounced like a KH in, in Hittite. And his wife was Dakamunzu. Now, conventionally, uh, Nibkururia was Tutankhamun. Uh, and if you look at it, Tutankhamun's personal name, Nebkeperura, is a pretty good match for Nibkururi. Okay, the Ket bit's missed out, but it's not unusual for foreign countries to squash up the Egyptian names. So, conven the conventional view has got to be pretty good. The trouble is, his great wife, shown in the picture, uh, Ankes and Armen, originally Ankes and Aten, but once uh, Tutankhamun had come to the throne, uh, the god Amun became back in, in favour, and her name became Ankes and Amun. Now, Amun's all right, because clearly Dakamunzu has Amun on the end, um, but Ankes is nothing like Dak. So Tutankhamun's name ties up rather well, but his wife's name doesn't tie up. What about Taharka? This is a picture of Taharka and his, and his wife. <laughs> um, Taharka's personal name is Nefertum Kura. His great wife, Tahakanaman. Now, Tak or Dak is identical. And, the, and in all the Egyptian queen's name, there is no name that ties up as well with Dakamunzu. It is the closest. Um, so Taharka's wife name ties up, but his own names, well, the, back, the back's all right, but the front doesn't appear to fit. But if we look at Hittite texts, Nefer, the first part, the Egyptian first part of Taharka's name, was not written Nefer, 
It was written nib by the Hittites. And the, the great example of that is the great wife of Ramesses II, Nefertari. Her name is written Nibtari. In, uh, in the various letters, um, Ramesses II, contemporary of Hattusili III, who wrote all the history stuff we started off with, um, the queens wrote to one another. So there, there are letters between the queens, besides between the kings, and uh, Nefertari is always written as Nibtari. Now, if you take the Nefer of Taharka and write Nib, then Taharka's name could be written Nibkururia. It's as good a fit as Tutankhamun's. In fact, there are several other pharaohs who would be a reasonably good fit. Um, it's the wife that makes the difference. So if you look through the history of Egyptian history at, at the king's names and their wife's names, Taharka's is the best match. Uh, just a couple of uh, uh, more bits and pieces just to finish. Many years ago I wrote a detailed argument, uh, argument for SIS to show that Putting Superluliuma the first in the Amarna period has a mass of contradictions. But the argument that always came back against me is that there are lots of names in the Hittite history of Superluliuma and in the and in Amarna. Half a dozen, maybe seven different names that tie up. All of the information is totally contradictory uh, if you look at it, but the names are pretty good. Now, that's a strong argument, but this correlation has as many names that tie up as with the Amarna. We've already seen uh, the, the king's wife ties up. We've already seen Tutkalia III uh, has the same name. And I'm going to tell you about a few more. The ruler of Kutmar. Uh, remember on the map when uh, Superluliuma marched to, uh, to uh, Mitanni, to, to Lake Van? He passed the city of Kutmar and he, he records that I overpowered Kutmar and I gave it as a gift to Antaratli of the name of, Alsh, of the land of Alshi. In 660 BC, the inhabitants of Kutmar killed and Daria, who had come from Alshi and captured the city. Now, and Daria and Antaratli oh, are very similar names of the same place. So this is another very tight correlation. It's also very good because the Hittite, as I said, I dated that to 667 BC, um, it was around 660 BC that they killed Andaria. Obviously, if those had been the other way around, it wouldn't have worked. <laughs> he has to be killed after he's given the city. Um, so there's a reasonably tight fit there. Um, so that is another, another name, not just name, but action that ties up remarkably closely uh, in the two histories. And the final... Uh, one, two Shunashuras. Um, in the Hittite history, there are one, two, three separate documents which are treaties between Hittite kings and somebody called Shunashura. It's not a spelling mistake, it actually is a double SH for some reason. Um, there's a lot of argument about these theories. Is it all one, is, is it all, all one treaty? Uh, not, not two. But the, but the wording is a bit different in each one. They're all clearly with somebody called Shunashura. Some Hittite uh, historians argue there are two Shunashuras and two treaties. The first treaty is with a Tutkalia. There's no doubt about that. The name is on the treaty. Second one they don't know. Um, it's a sort of 50-50 with, with Hittite historians. Some, was, some argue it's Tutkali of the third and Superluliuma are the, are the two Hittite kings with two Shunashuras. Others argue differently. So it's not, not that clear cut. But 
we can check this to a certain extent um, with the with the uh, history of the uh, of the seventh century. During the reign of Ishkalu, who we have, we have said was Tutkalia the third, there was a ruler of, of Cilicia uh, called Sanduari. Now, the way these names go, that's pretty close to Shunashura. He was accused of conspiring with Ishkalu, um, and the Assyrian Kiesa had him captured him and executed him. I, I think I think chopped his head off and carried his head back to Nineveh or something awful. Um, so here you have a a king of Cilicia with a similar name to Shunashura in the time of Tutkalia the Third, if I'm right. The peace accord of 662 between the Assyrian king Ashurbanipal and Mughalu, who I argued is Superluliuma, also included Sanda Sharme of Cilicia. Now that name's even closer to Shunashura. This is interesting because it shows that um, if Mughalu was uh, Superluliuma the first, and Sanda Sarme, his ally, was Shunashura, not surprising there was a treaty between them. It also shows that Cilicia, as well as the, uh, the Anatolian plateau, was independent of Assyria at this stage. So each time we look at something in the Hittite history, there's a parallel in the history of the, seven, the, the 600s BC. And of course, this adds even two more names that tie up. There are as many names tie up in this period uh, than do in the Amarna period. So that argument that Superluliuma has to be in the Amarna period doesn't doesn't uh, carry any particular weight anymore. And that's it. Well, there was uh, also another tie-up. Um, yeah. In the play Friends of Mrs. Mr. 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 Second, yeah. he recalled the play in the late rate was killed supposedly yes. you and yes. said his son. Yes. But in the rain, late reign of Essabenical, there was also a mysterious illness that put Essabenical out of his and the last seven years of his life. Yes, yes. And he walked around in Ascot. Yes, yes. So there could have been a, a serious plague going around about 640 BC. It would fit. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. right at the beginning, we were talking about the various invasions. I know of an invasion from the west at around that time, around, around 680, and that's a sort of matter of uh, Trojan War and uh, Mitre sort of coming into Anatolia and causing all the trouble. Well, Mitre was in Anatolia, he was king of, of Phrygia. Uh, Mitre. But he was also invading. He was he, not a stationary king, he wasn't sitting there, he, he was actively... If you look at the, the history of, of around 715 BC, when Michael was the biggest pain uh, as far as uh, Sargon was concerned, um, he had moved south from uh, Gorion, the capital of Phrygia, to Tyana, which was the, the two were new again. Just far enough away from the Syrians to be safe. There, there, there is an actual uh, inscription of the um, Black Stone of Tyana with an inscription with the name of the light in it. It's written in the original language. No problem with that. Yeah. Yeah. It's your fate. I just did it with my own. Two or three days. What I've presented today is a very tight correlation, yeah. but it's only part of a much bigger correlation that extends from about. 715 BC, down to about 550. Yeah. Basically, I'm totally in agreement with the major changes, uh, the, the little bits. Mm. Um, 
Different questions. Yeah. Um, is a type one, not a, a known. Um, this is from a regular article. What the charts obviously did not know was that Dagonunzo was not the Queen's name, but that her Egyptian title, Taf Kunet Nesu, the royal consort. Well, in every, in every, and I looked this up, there's a very good list of pharaohs, personal names, and great queens. Uh, from a got, I got the reference. Um, and that's where I, you, you do actually see it sometimes written, Duck Amel, but, but the full uh, name is Takatak uh, apparently. And no, no, one, no one said anything else, but it was her name. Well, they say that the Hittites took it as her name, but no, it's not the Queen's name, but her Egyptian title, the Royal Consort. Um, I can send you the reference. <laughs> okay, right. Well, you can send yeah, yeah, but come on, that's the usual fiddling to get round the fact that Tutankhamun's wife's name doesn't tie up. Um, it's typical of the blinking arguments you get to try and get around the problem. Well, I mean, they give the Egyptian wording. Well, the if you can find... Yeah, I've, I've never heard that. I've never heard that. Well, I'll send you the reference. Yeah. Okay. Well, what, what's, what's the affair's name? That's, that's not his name either, is it? You know, if, yeah, no, I'll, you've got to go with the film. You've got to watch it because you get this all the time. The, problem, the, the evidence doesn't fit. And so somebody tries to find a theory to get that. Just to say, you think that, you say, you know, losing pottery lasts for 200 years. It doesn't, but that's what they have to argue to fit the evidence because they're constrained by the convention. Well, I, I thought I'd heard that before. And, uh, it's certainly a plausible theory. Uh, yeah, yeah. 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 So you go out of the country and all the time to in the two names. That's the only way to get around that. See what their argument is. <coughs> Yeah, but if the widow was Tanya Tatarman, it's irrelevant, isn't it? Because that is her name. <laughs> yeah, it's just getting out of the problem. What would they argue? If, if, if they actually dated, dated Supernova to Taharka, no one said, Oh, this is a problem because the Queen's name, Daka Munzu, isn't really a Queen's name. The fact that it ties up exactly with Taharka's wife's name, yeah. Oh, yes. yeah. It was a thing, Bob, remember when I did the presentation on Taharka Dimi and you sent me gutter box arguing that the, the cuneiform on the boss of Taharka Dimi was rubbish. It could not be read. It, it, good <coughs> enough argument it was, because because that type of dimly is, is in the in the Hittite New Kingdom. And good enough argument was the engraver didn't understand cuneiform and he made up a lot of silly signs and it cannot be read. Okay, I don't I don't actually remember that. Well, one, but yeah, yeah you did. You sent the document. Okay. So the engraver produced silly signs because he didn't understand cuneiform. But somehow they were the precise signs that Sace had no problem reading when he used a Syrian cuneiform of 700 BC. It's dark, isn't it? It's dark. And, and the silly thing is, Gujarat must have known Sace had read it and what he read. It reads very easily. The problem is, one of the signs particularly is not known before the time of Sargon. Well, yeah, to argue, yeah, it, 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 it's an extreme example of trying to get round the problem that it doesn't work. It clearly has to be dated to 700 BC or later. 
And he, he produced a silly argument that you know, the, the engraver didn't understand and he just engraved rubbish. But rubbish, 700 years later, was perfectly readable. It's, you know, you see this all the time. It's, that, I'm not criticising it because the, the historians are constrained by conventional history and have to make the evidence fit. Well, yeah, everything just says. Wasn't it? Wasn't it you John, get the same thing in geology, don't you? John Crow at one time was compiling what he called death by a thousand anachronisms. Because yeah. <laughs> he reckoned there were that many things that didn't fit the conventional history. <laughs>